The JFK 35 podcast is produced by the JFK Library Foundation and made possible with the help of a generous grant from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. Moreover, as a great democratic society, we have a special responsibility to the arts. For art is the great democrat, calling forth creative genius from every sector of society, disregarding race or religion or wealth or color. President Kennedy spoke of the universality of artistic expression and its ability to transcend national borders in a broadcast for the National Cultural Center, what would later become the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. In the White House, both he and Mrs. Kennedy were lovers of the arts, supporting writers and artists during the administration. The JFK Library has carried on this literary tradition for the past 35 years in collaboration with Penn America and Ernest Hemingway's family with the Penn Hemingway Award. Learn more about this tradition and meet this year's honoree in this episode of JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Hello, I'm Jamie Richardson, and welcome to JFK 35. For nearly four decades, the JFK Library and the JFK Library Foundation have supported, in part, the Penn Hemingway Award. This award, named for Ernest Hemingway, who you've heard us talk about earlier in the season, honors a distinguished first book of fiction. Dr. Hilary Justice, the JFK Library Foundation's Hemingway Scholar-in-Residence, describes the origins of the Penn Hemingway Award. The Penn Hemingway Award is one of several literary awards administered by a writer's organization called Penn America. They're out of New York City. And initially, Hemingway's widow, Mary Hemingway, was a member of Penn America. She was a journalist, um, and she also wrote an autobiography. And she wanted to establish um, an award for best first work of fiction, best novel, in her husband's memory. She was looking to establish several things early on to sort of steward his legacy and ensure that his impact on culture wouldn't just be limited to what he wrote, although that's significant. Um, She wanted to give other writers uh, a boost, the opportunity that, that he had sort of accidentally Um, earning most of his early money with journalism. So the Penn Hemingway Award is now given for uh, the best first novel in every year, according to a panel of judges, all of whom are established novelists and fiction writers. The award was established in 1976, but it wouldn't be until 10 years later that the JFK Library entered the picture. The Kennedy Library's involvement started about 10 years after the first Penn Hemingway Award was given. So for the 10th anniversary of the Penn Hemingway Award, they uh, they arranged to have a gala event at the John F. Kennedy Library. And uh, the guest of honor for that one was Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And there was a dinner in the pavilion. And while she was sitting at dinner, Mrs. Onassis looked around and said, this is great. We should, we should do the Penn Hemingway Award here every year. And that uh, basically landed on everyone at the table as a, you know, as a command and they made it happen. So the Penn Hemingway Award has been celebrated at the JFK Library in Boston every spring ever since. So every spring since the mid-80s, the JFK Library has presented the Penn Hemingway Award, celebrating the author of a first work of fiction. Except for last year, when the ceremony was postponed because of the pandemic. This year, a virtual celebration was held to honor the winners and finalists from 2020 and 2021. Kavai Strong Washburn won the 2021 Penn Hemingway Award for his novel, Sharks in the Time of Saviors. He joins other notable winners, including Teju Cole, Joshua Ferris, Ha Jin, Edward P. Jones, Jhumpa Lahiri, Otessa Moshfeg, Tommy Orange, and Marilyn Robinson. Earlier this spring, I spoke with Kavai about his writing and winning the award. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So you are this year's Penn Hemingway Award recipient. So actually, I guess to start off the bat, how long have you been writing? It's hard to say exactly. I think, so this novel took me about 10 years, although I think at this point it's now coming up on 11 years since I first started it. And it was probably several years before that, that I started 
trying to seriously, you know, have published writing. So we could say maybe 15 years if I round up a little. Mm -hmm. And I did see that it um, took you about or 10 years to write the book. So when, what was, why was the process so long? Or at what point did you realize that the book was finished and kind of ready to be let out into the world? (laughs) Yeah. So the point at which I could tell that it was ready, the point that I could tell that I was done with it was when I had come back to it after taking about four or five months away from it, which I did multiple times, right? Every time I finished a draft, I would go away from it for several months and then come back to it with fresh eyes, with all of the last work cleared out of my head and read it again, and then start another draft, revising all the things that I could see that that needed to be fixed. And I did that cycle probably, I don't know, maybe four times, something like that. And after I had done it enough, it, it, it would contract, it would expand, it would contract, it would expand, things would change, but like the core of it was just sort of there and all the changes I made never really felt like it shifted the novel in a totally different direction. And that was the point at which I was like, I think I've done everything I can with this on my own. And so I, I need somebody else to, to read it and see if it's any good or anything like that. And ultimately what I settled on is I was just sort of like, you know, I'm just going to try and send it out to agents and see what they think about it. And so that, and, and that, that part of it, you know, the, the whole like several drafts in which it contracted and expanded and all that, that, yeah, that took several years because I would give myself like, you know, five or six months. And, and it took several years before that to write it because, you know, I'm a parent, I'm married, those things all happened over the course of the time that I was writing. I have other jobs and volunteer work I do. So writing, I never had the opportunity for writing to be my primary or only work in the world. So that, that slows it down significantly. And also, you know, I had written one other novel that I shelved. It's not very good that I used to learn about writing, but I still was having to learn a lot about writing and and what I wanted to be as a writer while I was writing this. And I think that slowed the process down as well. That's fascinating. Um, So I've also read that Sharks in the Time of Seder has been called one of the most richly imagined and evocative debuts. So what, and I've started to read it myself and I'm fascinated and can't wait to get back to it once I get off this with you. But what inspired your novel? I don't know. You know it's really hard to say. It was a combination of, of probably several different things. I think one was having been born and raised in the islands and then having left them for the continental United States. There were a lot of things I had sort of experienced just in in seeing the way that people talked about the United States and talked about sort of the history of America and the way that they imagined or talked about, you know, the islands, about Hawaii, about how it sort of occupied most people's imaginations that I encountered, which was largely as sort of a a destination, a sort of packaged exotic paradise for them to visit and then leave. Or it was the backdrop for stories about people that weren't from the islands and, you know, seeing all of those things, I think, was part of it. That was part of what made me start writing about Hawaii, because I didn't at the start. When I first started writing, I wasn't really focused on the islands. And I think I came back to them more and more as I kept rubbing up against experiences that bothered me in terms of people's understanding or artistic imagination of the islands. So that was part of it. I think another thing was that I got that image, the image of the shark being the shark saving a child from drowning, it showed up in my head one day. And I, I don't like to attribute any sort of like, I don't know, serendipity or, or divine intervention to the artistic life, because I think it's largely just like anything else. It's just a product of work. Like you just work and then you, you know, you produce something, but I did have that vision. The image just showed up in my head and, and I, for a while just questioned it and was like, well, what is this about? You know, and the more that I questioned it and felt like there were richer and richer answers coming back that made me delve into it more as a story. And then as I built out just the story, starting with just the family, I didn't really know what the bigger themes were going to be. Then I think some of those things I talked about previously, the experiences I've had coming from the islands and living in the United States, so the continental United States, those things started to inform it and other things I care about started to inform the novel. And then I guess that's how it sort of became the bigger thing than it became. And you've mentioned in the past that previous Penn Hemingway winner, Tommy Orange's book, There There, shares elements with Sharks in the Time of Saviors. Are there other new or sort of recently debuted authors that you identify with that are sort of in this cohort of exploring the different themes? Yeah, I think there there are a lot of authors whose work have has 
touched on on different aspects of them one of these books and, and I, I you know it's always tricky to like compare because i don't want to take anything away from another author or suggest that we're some way equivalent or anything like that and so in saying this i'm not necessarily equating myself to any of these author authors or anything like that one of the ones that comes to my mind first is c pam jong and i might be mispronouncing her last name and if c pam listens to this i apologize for mispronouncing her last name if that's the case she wrote a book that just came out as the same time as mine called how much of these hills how much of these hills is gold? And that book is, it, it in some ways feels like it does very similar things in the sense that it is pushing back against the standard narrative of the United States. And it offers this totally alternative vision for what things might have been like in the American West and probably were for a variety of different people. In this case, it's following a group of Chinese American at the beginning, they're sort of prospectors and they change into a lot of other things over the course of the, of the novel. But that book, I think, in the same way as, as mine is, is pushing back against kind of the standard American narrative and uses a family that I think at, at its center, it's still a story about a family, but it's also a family that is their story is one that recasts the standard mythology of America. So that's 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 one that pops into my head immediately, you know. There's also Macy Cards, these, these Ghosts are Family. I might be getting the name of that one wrong because I don't have it sitting right here on my desk. And so I'm forgetting the title or messing up the title perhaps a little bit. But she also has one that sort of traces the history of a family over a course of several generations. And it has aspects, you know, it's dealing with like the African diaspora and slavery and things like that. And so in that case, it's also, you know, a debut novel that came out at the same time as mine that touches on similar elements of sort of looking at the, the legacy of the United States passed down across generations with elements of mythology. And some people refer to it as magical realism or things like that are also in there. Those are a couple. I could keep going, but I feel like that's, <laughs> that was a really long answer. A, so I'll stop. Good way to get a great reading list going. And going back to the idea of pushing back against narratives, could you explain a little bit how your book um, does that with the idea of, you know, Hawaii being this destination or sort of a, a place for white people from the mainland to come and enjoy it and then leave? Yeah. So first of all, the, the book centers itself very squarely on a family that is that is of the islands that is born and raised there that have that have blood ties to the island in the sense that they're they're native hawaiian they're part native hawaiian and part filipino but they're like from and of the islands largely and they live in a rural part of the big island of hawaii which is honoka which is where i was born and raised and so you're automatically like right away you're off the beaten path like this is a place that's a town it's like a real town but it's a place that I think a lot of readers that are not from the islands will not be familiar with it has nothing to do with kind of the standard tourist mind like you know the imagination in a, in a tourist mind of the islands is just sort of like this endless beach paradise or maybe there's like I don't know some lush tropical rainforest that still terminates in a in a beach or something like that right and it's not at all like that in in Honoka and so you've got this family that's of and from the islands that's living in a rural part of Hawaii and we see pretty quickly that the life they live is not some sort of idyllic paradise right it's very much the kind of the same sort of issues and challenges that you would see in a lot of other parts of rural america are, are very similar to what you would encounter in in rural parts of hawaii but then on top of that there are additional elements of the legacy of annexation colonization and how that has driven driven a wedge between the people and the land and and has required a lot of work to kind of redefine and 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 return to a more a more symbiotic relationship with the land and things like that and so in, in looking at all of those things i think it just sort of it has nothing to do with the standard imagination of the islands as like you know a paradise that that is that is of and for for consumption and pleasure and sort of starts and ends with the plane touching down and lifting off of the islands and getting to um the award that you recently won were you surprised to learn that you had been nominated and then that you won and then you were at the ceremony a few weeks ago on Sunday virtually. Yeah, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all of it, you know, I don't, I would be very impressed if there is a, if there's a debut author out there that, that even I would say even a mid-career, late-career author that is like 
I am going to be nominated for this award and I'm going to win it, you know, and, and I deserve to, you know, I think there are probably not that many authors that would, that would think of things in those terms. Maybe there are more, I don't know. I can only speak anecdotally from the authors I've known and from my own experience. And I, I just don't really think in those terms. I always think it's nice. And I think as time went on and that the novel sort of, it came out and it got good reviews from the sort of, sort of like highly regarded institutions that are part of the publishing industry. And over the course of the time that it was published, you could kind of see occasionally there would be events I would have that would pair me with some of these authors that I've already talked about previously. And so you start to get a sense for sort of where you sit, whether it's a book that's kind of a little bit under the radar and might be something people are only going to discover later on or discover at the, at the paperback or whether it's the kind of thing that a lot of people are talking about or looking at or reading. And so it was, it was certainly very clear as the year went on that it was something that had gained about as much attention as, as any debut novel could during the pandemic and the lockdown. So it was that part was definitely clear. But <clears throat> after that, I think it's just there's so many good novels that come out in the year. You know, and and there were a lot of awards, some of the previous like major awards, you know, my book wasn't on the list or it was on the long list and then it wasn't on the short list or things like that. And there are just a lot of good books out there. Right. And so I, I try not to think about that part of it because I think that that's I, I, I think you're, I, I would only be setting myself up, I think, for a certain amount of like frustration and sadness if I was like, I'm going to win X, Y, Z award because I think it's such a subjective process. And I don't think it really is a good thing to kind of stake your, your feelings of success on because there, you have no control over that. And so I, I, don't, I didn't think about it too much. So it was very much a surprise and a very, obviously a, a very positive one. I was, I was delighted to have uh, won the award. It felt really good. Yeah, that's probably a healthy outset to have. Just release it and then just see what happens with it. Um, and you mentioned, you know, I course I don't know how I could forget this but of course 2020 was the year we were all in lockdown and home and sheltering in place and work you know figuring out how to live in this new way so what was it like to release a book during a pandemic and then see you know normally you probably go on a book tour or do in-person events how did that change or how was that different for you it was all it was all wiped away we had no I mean I had a I had a schedule set up that was completely it just like was obliterated right like we had already lined up things that were happening at bookstores and things like that and they all just evaporated and everybody was everybody was scrambling to try and figure out what they were going to do but you know it was such a it's such a it remains you know even if we look now at what's happening in india it remains such a cataclysmic event right like this this illness just sort of sweeping across the country that there were always bigger things that were happening that I just sort of kept it in perspective. I don't know. I, I guess I didn't get to, I, it, like it was sad and disappointing at times. And there were some incredible events that I was going to be part of that I was really excited to be part of. You know, I got invited to the Sydney, um, the Sydney Writers Festival. And, and there were all these incredible people in the lineup that I was very excited to meet in person. You know, people that are in like the Pacific region that I've never gotten a chance to meet who's, who's writing I have read before and really enjoyed. And there were a few events like that that I was really sad to, to kind of have taken away. But by and large, I mean, I was working really long hours. I was having to get up really early and take away all of my writing time to start doing my desk job so that I could swap with my wife halfway through the day and, and take over childcare. You know, we were splitting childcare and working full time. So there wasn't much room for anything else. And of course we were as scared as everybody else about what was going to happen and things like that. So, so much of that occupied so much of my time. And then there was the scramble with all of these different events. Everything was just sort of being completely redone that, you know, I didn't really have time to slow down and feel any sense of, of loss until much later in the year. And, and that was hard. You know, there were a lot of other really talented authors and, and books that have come out that have had to struggle similarly. So it's been hard. I think it's been hard for, for all of us, but I think on the other hand, it also keeps that, it keeps it in really good perspective to realize that like publishing a book is wonderful and having it gain a certain amount of critical acclaim is wonderful. And you obviously make art and hope that it's going to interact. You know, people are going to come to it and, and it's going to resonate with them and they're going to take something away from it. And having all those things happen is lovely, but it kind of pales in comparison to these sorts of really big things that help us rem help remind us how tenuous life is, how quickly everything about our daily lives can just totally change, you know? And I think more than anything, it just made me think about people. It's been so long since something like this has happened in the United States. 
And it's not the same way for people in a lot of other countries. There's people in countries that, you know, if you think about countries that have had to suffer through really long civil wars or famines or other ecological disasters and have had to do those things in multiple cycles in really short periods of time, you know, you come to realize how incredibly privileged and lucky we are. And so I think keeping all those things in perspective as well, just sort of softened the the blow. So, Yeah, I find it's been an an odd year and everything is sort of adapting constantly. So just take it as it goes, I guess, as long as everyone's healthy. Yeah. That's good. And getting back to the award, so it is named for Ernest Hemingway. We the John F. Kennedy Library has the Ernest Hemingway collection. Uh, we recently had, you know, Ernest Hemingway PBS documentary just came out. It's been a big year for Hemingway. And lots of folks learn about him in high school or, you know, in English classes there. Do you have a favorite a uh, sort of significant Heming- Hemingway story that you love or kind of connection from your own writing or sort of literary history? Yeah, so there are a few that I can think of. So just to kind of out myself so that I don't seem like I'm more sophisticated than I am, I actually didn't even read anything by Hemingway, I think, until I was in college. There might have been Hemingway in some of the English literature classes at my high school, but I think it just sort of happened cyclically. Like some years you, you ended up reading The Great Gatsby or whatever, and another year you might end up reading, you know, For Whom the Bell Tolls or whatever. And so whatever, for whatever reason, the cycle, the years that I was kind of in the literature at the late stages of my high school career, we didn't read Hemingway. So I hadn't touched Hemingway until I got to college. And then it was, I can't remember what the first short story was. But the first time I can remember having a, oh, wait, no, I know what it was. It was, uh, I'm I'm glad we're talking about this right now. It was a clean, well-lighted place. I remember reading that in college. And I actually don't even think it was a sign. I think I was leafing through the anthology that they they had given us. And I I read it and it took me a long time to really understand what was happening. But I I can still remember the sense. I don't think I'd ever read a story that had quite captured this sort of unnameable, sense of of kind of like loneliness right that haunts that story i feel like there's very much this this sort of like a loneliness that can't be named or or dealt with or processed directly that's kind of at the center of the story and i just it was i think it was one of the first short stories i remember reading where it sort of evoked this nameless emotion in me and i couldn't figure out what the story had done to me when i finished reading it like i finished reading it i was like what just happened uh and you know later on i was living in namibia as a, a volunteer teacher and i was working for an organization called world teach And so I was there for a little over a year as a teacher of English, math, and even computer studies at this little boarding school in a really remote part of Namibia. And so when I got there, and this is pre like a lot of the digital devices that we have now, there weren't really any ebook readers, so to speak. And there weren't even like a laptop was pretty expensive at the time. I didn't have either one of those things. So I carried a few books with me. And then when I got there, uh, in the corner of the closet in the house I was staying in, there was a, there were a few old paperbacks. And one of them was a collection of Ernest Hemingway short stories. And I read that over and over because I didn't have that many books while I was there. So I read through it pretty quickly. So I read that, that collection over and over. And one of the stories that really stuck out with me that I still keep with me in my mind is a story that I believe is called an African story or, or an Africa story. And in it, there's like a... a father and a son and their guide and they go on this hunt in I don't know maybe it's Kenya they go on an elephant hunt and then there's a moment where the child is kind of exposed to the blood of an elephant and he keeps a flake of it and there's this line where he kind of says I you know he kept the flake of it hoping it would mean something someday and it never did and it was one of those ones where I could just see like he just yanks you across this character's entire life in one sentence Right. And so, you know, that no matter what happens later on in that person's life, there's going to be this thing about, I don't know, mortality, death, failure, whatever it is. They, they keep hoping they're going to understand that over the course of their life and they never do. So there's that. I, there's a couple other stories. I feel again, I feel like I might be talking too long, <laughs> but that was, you know, there's like I can think of one or two other times in my life where one of those stories is kind of intersected with my life in a, in a meaningful way. That's a really amazing image to have and to, to keep with you and, you know, for that character. And then as readers later on to have that that wallop. So I have two questions before we wrap up. One was brought up by something you said earlier is that you do have a previous novel that you had worked on. Is there any chance that you would ever go back to that? And no, I <laughs> see so you shaking no. your head. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, there's not a chance. And that's okay. I think one of the things that was really good about that novel is, so it was the first novel, it was when I first sat down and I was like, well, I want to write, you know, I want to write a novel. 
And so I started writing it and I spent a long time working on it and revising it. And it was an opportunity for me to really sit down and learn craft. Cause I didn't, I don't have any classic, you know, formal teaching as a, as a writer. I didn't go to an MFA program. I didn't even take any, any creative writing classes in high school or college. Well, I took some in, in high school. They're just part of the curriculum, but it, once I got to college and everything thereafter, I never took any sort of formal writing program or anything like that. And so I had to learn all those things while I was writing this first novel. I had to go and like find books about it and like read essays and articles and like really reread things that I loved and really try to unlock them from a craft perspective and understand what it means to write and how you do it and what all the components are that you need to consider. And those were all things that I was working out while I was writing this novel. So, you know, from the start, it's probably going to be pretty flawed just because I'm having to learn how to write as I'm doing it. And then I spent a bunch of time revising it and revising it. And I finally just one day, like I spent, again, I spent a bunch of time away from it. I put it in the desk for like six months or maybe a little bit more. And I wrote some short stories and did other writing. And then I came back to it and read it with fresh eyes, having read a bunch of other stuff and written a bunch of other stuff. And I was like, this is just not that good. Right. Yeah. I just asked myself the question. I was like, if I, if somebody were to give me this book and read it and it wasn't me, would I have kept, would I keep reading it? Would I want to keep reading it? And I was like, well, no, I mean, it's fine. It's well written. It's not badly written, but it's just missing that, you know, it's not suffused with enough of, I think my own, it, it didn't have sort of, it didn't touch the third rail of like my life in a way that sort of coursed the novel with this essence that you can't fake as a writer that has to be there or else the work is dead it wasn't there. Right. And, and, but I was, and I was like, I think for a long time, I've been really scared of, of just being like, all right, well, this is done. And so I finally was, I was like, you know, I, why should I write this anymore? And for, I think for just a brief moment, I was scared that I wasn't going to be able to write another novel, but I think the next, very next day I sat down and started working on other things. I worked on short stories after that for a little bit, but it was like, Oh, I can write, I'll be able to write whatever I want. I can always write another thing. And it's so funny because it's not any different than anything else you know, <laughs> in terms of a craft of like learning how to do something, whether we're talking about sewing or singing or I don't know, repairing a bicycle, any of these sorts of things, like you have to learn and you have to fail as part of that learning process. And so the novel was like a learn, it was an excellent m way to learn how to write. And that's all it was as a, as a, like, you know, as a, the best version of that story that it could have been, it was a failure, but in terms of it helping me become a writer, it was a success. So it's just, you know, I learned from it, but it was not something that it should ever be published. And I, I don't, I, the story doesn't compel me enough to be like, oh, let me go back to it and try and remake it. So. Yeah, I feel I, I do sewing myself and there are definitely things where I'm like, oh, that was a learning. That's okay. And that's okay to learn or kind of fail. And then you pick yourself up and go on from there. That's great. And so this Sharks in the Time of Saviors is your first novel. But if folks after reading this, they want to read anything else you've written, where else can people find your work? There's a few short stories that are published in sort of disparate literary magazines and that those particular issues might be out of publication or you know out of print at this point in time. There is one that was published in, in Barrel House called Departures Arrival. I can't remember the issue of, of Barrel House, but this literary magazine. There, I published something in, in Mid-American Review, which was... I can't remember the name of it. And I published something in McSweeney's, which was then got, it got added. It got anthologized in the best American non-required reading. And I think this was in 2015. And that story is called what the ocean eats, I think. And that was my first like major, like it was published in like, I was like, Oh, this is like a literary magazine. I read, I got published. It's super exciting. Uh, that came out in, in 2015. So there's like a, you know, a smattering of short stories that are around in a few places, but other than that, you know, I don't, I don't have a huge like publishing CV before this novel came out. Well, it's excellent. We hope to uh, read more from you soon if you are so inclined to write more, but we want to congratulate you again. And thank you so much for speaking with us Kavai, today. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of JFK 35, a podcast from the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Visit our podcast page at jfklibrary.org forward slash JFK 35, where we'll have more information on topics mentioned in this episode, including this year's Penn Hemingway celebration and more information about the award. 
If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at JFK Library using the hashtag JFK35. If you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening and have a great week.